Topic two, investments not measured at fair value. The first is the cost method. This is permitted under IFRS when controlled companies are reporting separate entity financial statements or parent companies are preparing pre-consolidation internal statements. So when is this mostly used? Uh, under ASPE, when equity investments are not actively traded or quite frankly, management uh, just determines that they would like to simplify the accounting purpose as recording it at cost, you will see, is by far the easiest method of recording an investment. Under the cost method, you would debit the investment account for the total amount that you paid for this investment, including transaction including transaction costs. And then throughout the period, you would just leave it recorded at cost. At the end of the story, you would remove the investment. So you would debit um, the amount of money that you received, credit the investment at cost, and book your realized gain or loss at that time. So fairly, fairly simple. There are a couple of exceptions to that. The first is dividends. While it's not an exception in the sense that it doesn't uh, touch the investment account, it does hit your financial statements. So dividends, similar to um, a previous topic where we discuss how to record dividends under fair value through profit and loss and fair value through OCI for investments that are recorded at fair value, dividends here when um, an equity investment is recorded at the cost method and it um, relates to that equity investment, when um, those dividends are declared, similar, uh, this exact same, since you don't have any control or influence, you uh, would record the dividends when they are declared and you would reverse out that dividend receivable when those dividends are paid. The other exception to no impact to the financial statements under the cost method is impairment. If the investment itself that you initially recorded at cost is impaired, you would recognize immediately that impairment to reduce the amount of the investment on your financial statements on your statement of financial position, and you would record impairment loss. So this would be a debit impairment loss to the P&L and a credit to the investment on your balance sheet. Your other method for investments not measured at fair value would be the equity method. This is possible um, and is, it must happen under IFRS when an investor has the ability to exert significant influence over the investee. Under ASPE, you are permitted to record it using the equity method when the investor has the ability to exert significant influence. However, you may also choose to record it under cost method as I've discussed in the previous slide. Okay, so how do you determine whether or not there is significant influence that is able to be exerted? Uh, the first rule of thumb and the, the very first thing we look at is what percentage does the investor have of the total outstanding uh, equity shares. So those, those shares that can be voted on that you can you know turn the direction of the company. And we say anywhere between 20 to 49% of the shares is where there's significant influence. So under 20, we would say that that is a passive investment. Remember, you can't call up Elon Musk and give him advice about Tesla. Uh, over 49% and you would have uh, control. So, you know, the 49%, you know, 50, depending on board seats, now you're getting into control. So if you owned like 60% Tesla, uh, Elon's working for you. 20 to 49%, that is your ability to, to really influence the items, to really have a discussion, to say, mm, is, this, is this really the best 
things should you really be reusing your rockets going to outer space or hey maybe you're like the one that called up Elon and we're like hey I don't really understand why we keep throwing out these rockets is there any way we can reuse them so again you have a seat at the table you have your ability to uh, communicate to um, the people in charge however you do not have the ultimate decision uh, I put here professional judgment because we need to look at other indicators of significant influence and all of these need to be assess together. What is your representation on the board of directors? So do you have, you know, 15, 20, 25% of the total outstanding voting shares, but you have two fifths of the board seats? I would say that you have the ability to exert significant influence. What about participation in decisions on key policy, uh, policies? What about material transactions between two companies? Are you a key supplier? Uh, is there any contractual sharing of key technical information or the exchange or sharing of management? Again, this will all come back to the case facts. As discussed in a previous course, it's substance over form. Your bankers, your lawyers, your, your people, you, you cannot have the ability to, to write something when and where in substance it says something, but the form of it um, is saying something else. So if that is ever the case, we look at the substance. What is this really meaning? Who can make their life difficult? Who can, you know, put reusable, uh, reusable rockets on, on the table and have that as a, a significant um, matter to discuss? Whenever you hear the equity method of accounting, I want you to think of the accounting key phrase, one line consolidation. As this equity method, you will see, ends up being one line on the financial statements, the investment line, but what increases and decreases that investment will take on the behaviors of a full-blown consolidation. Equity method, one line consolidation. Let's look at some basics. When we purchase an investment that will be accounted for using the equity method, we record it initially at cost. So exactly as we discussed earlier in this video. Then, during the middle of the story, the investor's portion of net income increases the investment and creates uh, equity method income as well as a net loss would decrease the investment account. Dividends, and this should be noted as a key difference um, from a previous video. Here, dividends actually reduce the amount of this investment. This is because under the equity method, you have significant influence on the company, which means you have the ability to impact the declaration of dividends, and those dividends represent a reduction in your overall investment. As such, the investor's portion of dividends decrease the investment account with the debit to cash. At the end of the story, when you sell this equity, um, this investment that you're accounting for under the equity method, you would credit the investment account to zero it out and debit to record the amounts received and any differences, any plug, would be the debit or credit to the income statement, which would be for the realized gain or loss on the sale of this equity investment. Those are the basics. It gets a little bit trickier from there. Let's look at some complications. If the investor's portion of all other components of comprehensive income must be accrued and accounted for annually, this means not only comprehensive income, but other comprehensive income, as well as any loss from discontinued operations. If you have losses, so remember how we record losses, maybe a debit to the uh, loss um, on the equity investment, and it would be a credit to the uh, investment on the balance sheet. So if you end up having so many credits, so many losses, so many credits to the investment account, so many losses, uh, and the investment could be reduced to zero. Now we would leave it at zero 
and we wouldn't make that negative, so we wouldn't turn into a liability, uh, only in the instance that the amount of the investee's obligation is guaranteed by the investor. So we could kind of bring it down to zero, but never have it as a liability unless we've signed some sort of paper or we've made some sort of verbal guarantee by the investor. So we can't turn that investment into a liability. Uh, this investment must be tested annually for an impairment. And if its uh, total value is less than its carrying value, then we must record uh, an impairment loss immediately. Um, it's possible we might only sell part of the investment sold. So in which case we would calculate the gains or loss based on the average carrying value. Oh, there are also several more complexities associated with the acquisition differentials and, um, and intercompany transactions, which will be explored in later chapters, which would also apply here to the um, to this one line consolidation. Again, the accounting key phrase one line consolidation, the factors that impact a consolidated entity for the most part impact this equity account. The difference is that instead of smushing together the entire set of financial statements, which we will do with a full-blown consolidation, which we will see in future chapters, not in this one, all of this happens in one line of the statement of financial position. The fluctuations will increase or decrease that investment account, and the corresponding offsetting debits and credits will be to the income statement to recognize either the income or losses and dividends. Let's look at a few examples to kind of firm this up. Company A acquires 25% of Company B for $25,000. In that instance, we record our debit to the investment account for $25,000, what we paid. It was at cost and there's no transaction costs mentioned here. And we paid cash, so credit cash for $25,000. Company B pays a dividend, so they declare and pay on the same day a dividend of $10,000. Our portion of the $10,000 is 25%, so we would receive a dividend from Company B. Company A would receive 25% of the $10,000 dividend, which would increase our cash by $2,500. And because it's a dividend in a company that we have significant influence on, we're recording using the equity method, that would decrease our investment in company A by 2,500. If you look at these two transactions together, intuitively we can start putting together the picture and it makes sense that it's almost like we got a refund, right? We paid 25,000 and then there was a dividend of 2,500. So it just kind of, it's like, hey, thanks so much. Um, here's a refund for your item. Okay, now let's look at this. Company B reports income of $40,000. 40,000 times your share of 25% means that your investment went up in value by 10,000, by 25% of 40,000. And we are going to reflect that through the recognition of equity income of our investment on our P&L statement. Conversely, if this was reports a loss of 40,000, the credit would be to our investment account and the debit would be to the equity loss. All right, let's look at a question for you now. Alpaca Inc. bought 40% of Llama Inc. on July 1st, 2020 for 60,000. Llama issued dividends of $10,000 on October 1st and reported 2020 net income of $20,000. What is the value of Alpaca's investment at the end of 2020? Is it A, $56,000? Is it B, $64,000? C, $72,000? Or D, $48,000? If you said B, $64,000, you would be correct. Let's see how we calculated that. All right, 
So here, I'm looking to see what the value of Alpaca's investment is at the end of 2020, which means I really need to go to the, <laughs> I need to go to the beginning of the story. And I know that at the beginning, when 40% was bought, that was a debit to the investment account for 60,000. And there was a credit to, uh, to cash for the same 60,000. Okay, and this is to record uh, the purchase at cost. Okay, so now uh, there were, on October the 1st, there was $10,000 worth of dividends. So I got 4,000 dividends, because, or $4,000 worth of dividends, because I own 40% of Llama Inc. And there was $10,000 worth of dividends declared. And so I increased my cash by 4,000, but it was like a little refund of my initial investment. So I would record a credit to my investment account of this $4,000. And this is to record dividends uh, declared and paid. Okay, and now my last transaction here is for the net income. Okay, so I have net income, so that's positive of 20,000, and so I know that that increases my investment account. Uh, so 20,000 times by my 40% ownership means that my investment goes up at, by 8,000, and I have equity income by that same amount, the 8,000. Okay. So now I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna see what all hit the investment income. What would my T account running total be for this? So it would be a debit of 60,000 at the very beginning. And then I would have a decrease by 4,000 here. So I'll just link this here just to visually show you. And then I would have an increase by 8,000 here. And so my total value in my investment account at the end of the year would be 64,000, which would be why B is the correct answer. People, you have done amazing. Uh, thank you so much for your hard work, and I look forward to talking with you again in the next chapter.